Yeah, so what's fine is that you should go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll see. We got invited just to my daughters for Thanksgiving. And can I just do this? She's not here. Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, I know. I would like to. Well, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, she, she does have health issues. And she worries about all the things. We're thinking that she, what if, what if. She's, you know, it's hard. It was an hour and a half, and the wind, wind was just blowing the car all over the place. Something went on, and I was like, Yes. 
Well, she's behind like the the sound Pants. If I didn't have stained yeah. clothes, when he want to play You know, when I, when I have a rule, rule about, apparently, at any point, that within a week I have to stain any new pair of pants or shirt. And so at that point, I don't want to steal it. Yeah, I. It's a long time well, so I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Okay. Good news is we did get all of our class material uploaded to the internet. Uh, um, a couple of you that even uh, let me know you were ready for them. Bad news is my lovely assistant was only able to make six extra copies for tonight. So uh, we'll start the auction. <laughs> all right, here you go. One. Five more. Five more. Five more. Donovan, four more. Oh, come on. I know you're thinking, on the one hand, I don't really want to take it. Okay, well, let our visitors share. Well, all right, all right. Tony's got it. Good job. Ask and you shall receive. That's the two more. Two more. Two more. Two more. Two more. Two more. I don't want I got one. All right. I do feel like an auctioneer. <laughs> All proceeds. Last one. Last one. I, 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 last one. Uh, Mar? Mar just raised her hand. She didn't, I don't think she knew what she raised her hand for. But she, <laughs> well, she volunteered. Yeah, that's smart. <laughs> Anthony, here in a heartbeat, can I ask you to lead us in a word of prayer? Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to be over uh, starting off in 1 Peter 4, and then we're going to jump over to Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 tonight as we continue in our study talking about our one another passages. Um, boy, I wish Lamar was here tonight. But the, the subject tonight is one that he's uh, done some work on in the past, and I've always liked the way he presented it because it's the idea of how it is we serve one another with the different abilities or gifts that we have and how it is that we use those things in order to bring ourselves to unity. Before we get started tonight, Anthony, would you go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we are so honored and so blessed that we have this opportunity to come together and in the study of your word, Father. We pray that we will have that open heart and open mind to, to dive into your word and study it, Father, that we can 
that we can learn from it, that we can apply it to our lives. We pray that you would be with Brian as he teaches the lesson that he's prepared and that we would have always that opportunity to, to go out into this community, into this world, and, and to teach people about you and your beloved son. We ask that you would continue to guide us and that we ask for forgiveness of our sins, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Anthony. So our passage that we want to kind of focus in on tonight is 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. This is one of our many one another passages. We've been talking about those. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. But this is a fun passage because there's a lot of different words here that are important. Um, the first one is to say each one of us has received a special gift. That's a that's a statement that's repeated many times in Scripture. We're going to camp on it here in just a couple of moments. Every one of us has received a special gift from God. That's a, that's a matter of faith, meaning the Word of God has revealed it. We're supposed to believe it. So we have to think about that for a moment. Employ it in serving one another. That whatever our gift is, uh, that gift has been given to us for the purpose of serving one another. As good stewards, stewardship, we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight too, why stewardship is so important to understand, of the manifold grace of God. What's a manifold? Hey, I'm not a mechanic. What's a manifold? What are you that's a mechanic? Exhaust and intake. What does the manifold accomplish? What does it do? Many cylinders. Okay, so it... It diversifies, it sends out, you might say. In this case, the word manifold is describing the idea that God's singular grace has a lot of different ways it's manifested in our lives. And so there's kind of a neat sense of how uh, of how that works together here in the grace of God. A couple of things we want to look at here, and uh, that's to understand when we're talking about gifts, what are we talking about? Well, there's two, there's two fantastic chapters in the New Testament that hit us with this. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. What's really neat about these two chapters is that they're parallels of each other, but they're also very different from one another. And we'll talk about why that is. So let's take a look at these back verses. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, verse 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Can somebody, can we read that for me? If you've got that, go ahead. God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. So our first statement here, the apostle is talking about the gifts that are given. And what do we typically call these gifts that he mentions here? What do we typically refer to them as? What kind of gifts are they? Spiritual, Spiritual gifts. Good. What else might we say? Miraculous gifts. Miraculous gifts. Now, what do we need to know about this? What, what's the one thing that, that I would say, the most important thing you need to know about miraculous gifts today? They're not here anymore. A uh, couple of reasons why. Actually, what's interesting is in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us why. He says those things were meant to cease when that which has which is perfect has come. Oh, I'm going to scratch my head. What's, per, what's the perfect that comes? The law of liberty. Tacho? The Christ, Christ is in the, a part of that. The law of liberty, how is the law of liberty manifested to us today? Scripture, New Testament. So when the New Testament is finished, that, I like, I like you went to James there, that perfect law of liberty is before us. That which is perfect, that which has been completed, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, uh, the thoroughly equips men for every good work. So here's an important idea. That idea is Scripture, the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit came in this way. Now, what's neat is Romans 12, uh, 6 through 8. Somebody get that for me. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Somebody grab that verse. Somebody grab that verse. Go. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of the state, his service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he, oh, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. 
So here we have a list that the very first words start out exactly the same. We each have gifts, differing. God gives gifts, they're different. There's something very different about these gifts. What's the difference? They're not miraculous. They are not miraculous. Now, now wait a second, Tom. I'm gonna put you, I'm gonna make a hard question for you. None of them miraculous? What's that first one? First one is prophecy, but here's what's strange. Tom's right. None of the rest are miraculous. And by the way, I'm going to make a point to say prophecy actually can't really be miraculous either in this sense, and, and we'll explain why. So is there another way where we have prophecy that's not a miraculous gift, but a gift that comes um, in a way that we might say is still important, but not necessarily miraculous? What, what prophecy? I've, I've talked about this before. What is the great prophecy that you and I have as prophets of God, Stephen? I'm kind of thinking that when we evangelize, we're actually right. bringing news to people that have never heard it before. So right. in a sense, it's as if we really are prophets. Well, that's very good. We are prophets. What's the big prophecy? Well, we're telling people that Christ is returning. Jesus is returning. The most important prophecy in history of the human race is that Jesus is returning. He'll judge the world. And we have that. So we might come back and say Romans 12 and prophecy could well speak to that. Now, I said a second ago, there's a reason why this probably can't be. And I say can't, probably can't. The Corinthians had miraculous gifts. Do we already understand that? How did they get miraculous gifts? Through the laying on of hands. By whom? The apostles. The apostle Paul describes that feature. What did Paul tell the Romans in chapter 1? He says, I long to see you that I might impart spiritual gifts. Had they received spiritual gifts then? No. That's what's so fascinating about these two chapters. In Corinth, you have a church that an apostle had come and given spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts. In Rome, we have a statement that an apostle has not yet come to give miraculous or spiritual gifts. So their gifts are different. That's a really important idea. And so what we're seeing here in Romans chapter 12 is a list not of those miraculous gifts that in 1 Corinthians 13 were told ceased, no more apostles to lay on hands, but no more gifts to be distributed. But we're told that this is something else. So the first question I want you to think about is this. Give me a list. What are those things, those abilities. I'm going to take the first one, prophecy. And I said prophecy may well be the idea, the ability to render that most important prophecy of time. But what are the rest? Give me the rest. Tasha, what's next? Speaking in tongues. Well, speaking in tongues is what kind of gift? Miraculous. Romans 12 is a list of non-miraculous. So in Romans chapter 12, going back to verse 6, what's, the, what's on that list? Just give me the list. Serving. Teaching. Ex what is that? Exhortation. That's a big word. Encouraging. Sometimes encouraging verbally. What's the next one? Giving. Giving. What's the next one? Leading. Thank you, said leading. Leadership. So, you know what's really neat about these gifts? Um, there's one more, right? Mercy. That was the last one. Do you ever think of mercy as a gift? Uh, you know, some of these you might say are gift, you know, uh, uh, giving, if you have the gift of giving, what does that kind of imply you also have? The means to give, right? That's kind of neat to say, you know, if you have the means to give, you're given the gift of giving. What, what do you think the, uh, the gift of leadership, I, you know, the question is, how do these things come about? How do we know this list of gifts if somebody has them? In other words, how are they manifested to us. So somebody has the gift of giving. I said one way that might be manifested is you have the means to give. You have the uh, the things to give. Now, by the way, there's a few times in the scripture where what? Like the Philippians or the 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 widow in the end of the they didn't have the means. They didn't have the means and they still gave. So by the way, these are gifts that you can create. Now that's an important idea that we want to focus in on. Gifts are two thoughts. The abilities are two thoughts. 
Some of gifts or abilities are things that we naturally have. Sometimes there are things that we are going to develop. Things we have, we, we develop. I said, uh, we talked about prophecy, we talked about giving. What are some of the others again? Exhortation. What's that gift look like? The gift of exhortation. Okay. It can have a lot of different spaces. It can be a phone call. Yeah. It can be going and sitting with someone in the hospital. Yeah. It can be a card. It can be a lot of How do we, uh, let me ask the opposite question for a second. Uh, what is it? I, now, Wendy and I were just talking about this. I said, you know, sometimes, Wendy, I just don't think I have the gift of exhortation. I didn't use that word because I don't use big words at all. What, what does it seem like when we don't feel like we have that gift? What kind of person are you? Yeah, you're quiet. You're kind of shy. You're like, oh, I don't know the right thing to say. I'm not describing any of you here. That's sorry. I'm describing a lot of us here uh, that would say, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, uh, hold back. Exhortation. What else does it look like? We've got some good examples. Sitting with people at the hospital or, or uh, you know, a phone call. Um, George? Yeah, yeah. What does he do Sunday? Yeah. Yeah, he's always going around shaking everyone's hand. He's going, no, he shouldn't be. You know, he's doing it. That's great. That's great. Um, What else do you got? That's, that's good stuff. Yeah. Um, praying with someone, reading the Bible. I know when my mom was almost at the end of her life, a lady came and just read from the Psalms every day to her. And that, that seemed to be encouraging. To yeah, her. that's nice. It was me. That's nice. You know, I like to say this. Job's friends, I'm going to make a statement. You're going to laugh. You think I'm not telling the truth. Job's friends were good exhorters. The first week they showed up. Because what did they do the first week? They didn't talk. <laughs> they just sat with Job for a week. And I've always said, for that first week, those guys were great comforters. Those guys were great at giving, at giving a comfort and exhortation. Because they really weren't saying anything. It was just their presence that said a lot. So that's kind of a neat thing. Exhortation. Anybody else have something to throw on that, Tom? Well, I'll pick on um, Bobby Kent because she's probably a good example of this. We think of exhortation, we think we've got to go out. We've got to be the boisterous person, the, the glad hand, slap on the back, handshaker. But uh, she's always been the one that would send the card out for every yeah. little thing. Yeah. And uh, you don't have to be that kind of person. To be able to exhort, there are many other ways to be able to exhort yes. without being outgoing and gregarious. And card sending is fantastic. Uh, we got a few card senders here, and you're fantastic. You're a you're such a benefit to the congregation. It's so uh, important uh, that we get those kinds of moments. And uh, you know, I've gotten some cards at moments in my life where it made all the difference. And so that's a great thing. The extension of that now is uh, texting. Texting. Yeah. Very good. Well, what's the next one on this? Can't remember the order. I guess I have it right in front of me. I'll just look. Uh, what else do we have? We have uh, prophecy. You went by teaching. Teaching. <laughs> um, what's the gift of teaching look like? Oh, go ahead, Anna. Well, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about teaching is in the first century, of course, Christ and the apostles and disciples cast out demons. In a sense, when we're teaching to someone who doesn't know the gospel at all, we're, we're casting out lies. It's almost some kind of the, the same idea is that we are teaching them the truth and thereby fighting against those forces that are uh, convincing them to reject the Bible. What does the gift of teaching kind of look like? What what does it entail? And by the way, let's let's take away from it the idea of standing in a class. And being in the front of the class. That's that's just something you learn how to do. What's the real important idea that you have to be able to do to teach? Uh, Tasha? A little bit of knowledge. A little bit of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tasha, you're right. You know, whenever the Bible speaks about being the, the acceptable servant of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2, it talks about apt to teach, and there's an implication of knowledge there from verse 15. Gerald? Gerald? Oh, setting an example. Setting an example. Consistent. Now, what's really neat about that, Gerald? is that Paul told Titus, in Titus chapter 2, Titus, you've got to be the living example of everything you teach. And what's neat about that is that no one's any good as a teacher if they're not actually showing 
and what they're talking about. But in spiritual things, I would say even in practical things, a teacher oftentimes has to go through it, but in spiritual things, for sure. If you want to teach someone the gospel, all you really need to know is what you did to obey yeah. God. Yeah, I like the idea, and I've said that too, uh, that very thing myself, because, you know, well, I don't know what to do. Well, if you know what you did, that's enough that somebody else can know. And if you don't know what you did, let's talk. Uh, different conversation. So that's fine. That's fine. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go back to that passage I mentioned just a second ago that Tacho uh, was, uh, uh, maybe didn't know he was alluding to, but he was alluding to there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is again commissioning uh, Timothy as an evangelist. I uh, want to grab a couple of terms, though, that he uses that are key to characteristics of being gifted as a teacher. Verse 24 of chapter 2, servant of the Lord must not quarrel, must be gentle, able to teach, patient, humble. Uh, what kinds of things are you seeing there? What, what, what might be one or two words there that really grab you as a holistic idea? You know what I think of a lot? Somebody said something. Kind. Kind, yeah. Gentle. I like patient. I like patient. You know, uh, uh, Mrs. Haynes was a school teacher for a long time, and uh, you know, I, I think she she pulled all my hair out of her. So many times, because those kids could be frustrating. What do you have to always talk about? Be patient. Be patient. You may have to say the same thing twenty times. Be patient. You know, it's funny because that's what Paul is telling Timothy: be patient. And maybe he goes on to say at the, at the end of that chapter: maybe God will give him a chance if you're patient. So things like patience, gentleness, kindness. You know, we kind of think of teachers as, you know, they're eloquent and they're well-spoken and they can stand in front of people. The Bible talks about teachers in terms like that they're patient and they're gentle and they're thoughtful and they care. They're the example of what they're saying. All of these are things that the scriptures say are what make a teacher. So don't think for a second that, well, I can't be a teacher because and you're thinking what the world thinks of. Think of the characteristics that the Bible says a teacher is supposed to have uh, uh, to accomplish these things. Um, he who gives with liberality. Well, we kind of talked about that. Let me uh, let me go to the next one. Um, Brian, I just want to oh. back up the teaching, the thing that, uh, that you touched on it there, and Gerald uh, began along that line of being an example. Uh, but we take the, the, the course that, well, I, I can't teach. And that's such a lie. Because you can't wake up without teaching. You're teaching all the time. You're being an example all of the time. If you're having any kind of relationship or rubbing elbows with anybody in any kind of way, you're teaching. You're being an example. And so we've got to kind of get out of the way of saying, well, we want to be the professional teacher. We want to be as good as uh, Brian at teaching. <laughs> We hope we're better than that. Yeah. Uh, low so, standards, I know. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about, about what you're saying, though, is the idea, you know, every Sunday when we sing, every Wednesday when we sing songs, we are teaching one another, the Bible says. Um, the funny thing about being a, a teacher of the Bible is that you're not teaching things that, you know, you're coming up with. You're just showing things that are already there. You know, you're not, you know, you're not reinventing a wheel. You're simply pointing to it and saying, this is it. It's not complicated. It's not hard, but the things that it takes are patience and gentleness and love, and, and those are the things that the Bible really wants us to consider. Uh, two more, leadership. Uh, what's it about to lead? You know, a lot of times leadership's like teaching. Oh, I'm just not a leader. Um, and why is that such a bad way of thinking? Kind of goes a little bit to what Tom said about being a teacher, but why is it a bad way of thinking to say, well, I'm just not a leader? Well, if you're a husband, what? You're a leader in the home. If you're a mother, you're you're leading, you know, so Titus chapter 2 talks about the mother, and it uses the term that kind of represents the idea she's guarding the home. She's she's the, the caretaker of the home. She's the leader in that scenario, too. Uh, you know, most of our roles in life that we have to fulfill for the sake of God call in some aspect of leadership, of uh, the ability, even, even just for ourselves, you know, uh, taking care of ourselves and not not being the kind of person that just can't even do that. And there are people that can't even take care of themselves in this world. But to be in Christ calls us to that. Leadership. What? What is it? How does it manifest itself? What's the idea of, maybe in the simplest terms, like I said, maybe not 
elders or things like that, but what are the simpler <laughs> manifestations of leadership? <clears throat> George? Number one, setting a good example. You know, I love the fact that when it talks about elders, it uses a word that implies the idea that they stand before their family as the example they need to be. And that's, you know, at, at the heart of spiritual leadership, standing before and being the example is leadership, is leadership. You know, one of the greatest leaders in the Bible in the Old Testament, you tell me, who do you think is like the greatest leader in the Old Testament? Moses. Moses. And Moses was not what? What does he list his failures as? Can't speak. Can't speak. Uh, let's throw in there too old. Uh, let's throw in there tried before and failed. Moses has got a lot of great reasons why he is not a leader. And God says, no, you are. But what's fascinating about Moses is, you know, whether, you know, how, you know, he seems pretty effective throughout that time. But let me just suggest again that Moses' real characteristics of leadership were in moments like God saying, I'm going to destroy these people. And Moses says, what? What was Moses' plea? Do you remember Exodus 33? Actually, yeah, he says, you want to knock somebody out, you can take, in fact, he says, not just kill me, he says, you can do to walk to my name. Blotted out of the book of life. Why did he say that? What, what was his motivation for saying that? Being one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. He was caring about the people. He loved love the people. You know, in the New Testament, Hebrews, uh, three. Uh, the Hebrew writer makes a point to say Moses was faithful. I kind of think he's saying Moses was the greatest leader of the Old Testament. I, I would kind of look at it like that. Moses' great leadership was his great love for Israel. Nobody else in the entire Bible ever says, hey, take my name out of the book of life if you'll just give them a second chance. I've never said it for any of you. Truth be told, that's pretty heavy. That's the heaviest offer ever made. That's leadership. I think it's really interesting that God chose the most humble man on earth, and that's how it's quoted as being the leader. <laughs> yes, the most humble man. Uh, what is that? Numbers 11? Uh, most humble man ever. That's really a phenomenal statement. Well, one of the things Moses did that to me is shows his great leadership is he took advice from an older man. That's right. And Who was that older man? His father. Yeah, father lost the top. But, uh, you know, they have, they have advice. Sometimes you got to listen, right? Um, and what's interesting about that is it was, um, I'd love to go into that further to talk about the spiritual characteristics of leadership. And one of the big ones I push is delegate. You know, that was what Jeff was saying. Moses, you're doing too much. Delegate, you know. And, and that becomes, by the way, the system of judges that will run right up to the time of Christ, uh, what we call sometimes the elders of Israel. I was thinking about having a good influence on people, and I thought about when we were studying Ezra and Nehemiah, how they were able to get the people organized and doing what they needed to do. You know, the neat thing about Nehemiah's leadership, and boy, he was a fantastic leader, is things like, you know, I could get the best stuff on my table, but I eat what everybody else ate. Uh, I could tell people what to do, but I was out laying stones in the wall. I love it. Uh, that aspect of his leadership, and it really is important to consider that. Anybody else have something to throw on that? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, for us, I think we see leadership, um, and a lot of people are the people who are pushing a, us, our congregation, to grow and to mature. Um, you know, people who are going out and pushing us to do Bible studies or to, you know, uh, various things that we are doing are people who are. Yes, very much so. Um, and what's interesting about that is that that doesn't always look like the person standing in front. You know, that's what's neat about that. Like the person pushing is in behind, you know, and there's something really important about that. And uh, uh, what's kind of neat about that is, like I said, that's a pretty generic enough thing that we could say applies to a lot of people who are pushing others to excellence. Wow, that's a great, great point. Last one, mercy. This is the one I think is the most interesting because... Mercy doesn't seem like an ability, a gift. But the more you think about it, it kind of thinks that way. Why? What's, how is mercy an ability? How is mercy an ability? And first of all, is it a natural ability? No, it's hard to put somebody else ahead of yourself. Yeah. Number one. And uh, that, you need something. 
well, I need something, but that person needs it more than I do, and I need to show them that. I think what's interesting is mercy would be, in my estimation, the least natural. I'm using natural like Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 3, you know, the natural world, the spiritual. Mercy is the least natural ability, gift that there is. It's the one that is the most uh, uh, acquainted to God. Blessed are those who show mercy. Why? They shall be, what? They shall receive mercy. Remember that in Luke chapter 6? That's the thing about mercy. Mercy is something really special. How does it manifest itself? Tacho? Maybe kindness? Kindness is a great way. A great way to manifest kind of thinking of um, Barnabas and Saul. When Saul was, first became a Christian and nobody wanted to accept him, um, it seemed like Barnabas going out and taking him in was an actual mercy. You know what's interesting about that is that uh, Barnabas' name means what? You remember? Son... Of encouragement, yeah. Uh, exhortation might fit nicely to that. That's what's kind of neat about that. I, I've often thought of, uh, just talking today, uh, uh, just talking to Ramon today about Barnabas, and I was saying, you know, Barnabas is one of the more important people in the New Testament, but, you know, he didn't write any letters or anything like that, but I wonder sometimes if we would have the Apostle Paul if we didn't have Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas, the guy that ropes him in, and, you know, I think Grant talked about pushing from behind. Barnabas was definitely a, uh, gets people together. You know, Barnabas is neat because whenever Paul shows up at the church in Jerusalem, and everybody says, yeah, we're so happy to see you, so, Teresa's shaking her head, no. You know, my, my imagination, Paul walks in the front door, everybody gets up and runs out the back door. And Paul shows up, he's terrified. Everybody except for Barnabas. What on earth made him think, yeah, this guy, he's something. And can you see Barnabas standing up and hugging this guy in the middle of everybody else saying, he killed my, you know, Paul killed people. Paul killed people in that congregation. Where God says he persecuted people unto death, Stephen, he has a claim for that. So those people had a lot of reasons. And here Barnabas stands up, like I said, and it doesn't say he put his arms around him, but it's my imagination, you know, that Barnabas in some way reaches out and grips it. And then when Barnabas is up in Antioch and he goes, oh, we're getting Gentiles in, who would be the perfect guy to help me teach with them? Saul of Tarsus. I'm going to go all the way up to Tarsus and get Paul. And, oh, I'd love to have seen that conversation. Saul saying, you know, I'm, I, you know, I don't know if I should come. And Barnabas says, yeah, you're the guy. You're the one. Let's go. That's pretty great. That's pretty great. I like to think of that. Mercy is a great part of that because Barnabas, Barnabas was there when Saul persecuted. He was there, but beginning going back to Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 4, when we first met him, he was there. Mercy meant, what's the other word I'm thinking of? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Tom? Yeah, that's where I was going to go. Forgiveness is probably the chief thing that when we look at that, God, God says, vengeance is mine. Because our vengeance is we don't get even, we just get a little more than even. And uh, so when we're talking about mercy, uh, we have to go overboard on that idea of forgiveness. And we, we, we understand that we cannot be forgiven unless we're forgiving. Yeah. And uh, so you couple that with that whole concept of, uh, of mercy and the kindness and the love that we have to show to be able to do that uh, makes... A, a mature Christian person, a special person. Yes, yes. Uh, I think the best is safe for last. I think mercy is the best. That's, again, my opinion. But I think Paul is really lining us up for some things here. So let's go back to our first passage again, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, uh, where we're talking about this idea uh, of the description here. And I said we wanted to come to the idea of stewardship. Um, what is stewardship? What is stewardship? The management of uh, somebody else's stuff. All right, management of somebody else's stuff. That's a nice way of putting it. Somebody else has entrusted something to you, and you're responsible for it, and that's a great definition of stewardship. So in this case, we talk about stewardship. What might we describe this as? Well, uh, I would put these two ideas together. The rightly using God's blessing. Stewardship is rightly using God's blessing. What do I mean by rightly? Correct. Well, okay. Uh, 
Uh, well, how would you describe that in the, in the spiritual sense, to rightly use God's blessing? My, let me go to the one that's probably the easiest one to misuse, and that is the gift of giving, because we said that it likely means I have an abundance. So to rightly use that, Grant, go ahead. I was just going to say that stewardship is, you know, doing this for somebody else. Rightly doing that is doing what they want to have done with it. Nice. In their place. Nice. Now, by the way, that's really good because we need to define rightly as not what we think is right, but as what the owner of the goods thinks is right. That's important. Thank you. What else do we got? What else do we have? Anybody? So rightly, to, to use it properly. That's important. But you know, in fact, a lot of times we talk about the, uh, the work of the church. When the men come together and talk about the things of the church, we think about the idea of, you know, we take up a collection, and we have to be righteous stewards of those things. That might be another application of that. But the other thing, oh, go ahead, Teresa. I was just thinking of using it only for the things you have authority to use it for. Nice. And that's different. The church is different than individuals. Yes, very important that you said that. Uh, let's let's make that statement, and maybe another time we come back to it. But what the church's obligation is, and what the individual Christians' responsibility is, there's a different authority there, and so that's an important point. Uh, first thing we say is rightly, but the second thing I want to point out is using. What's the parable for the guy who was given stewardship, and it actually goes to the point where he didn't want to unrightly use it, so he didn't use it. What story? What parable? The, the talents. You know, it's a thing that sometimes, you know, you get, I tell you what, in that story, I sympathize a little bit with that guy. I'm a little, uh, I thought, well, I don't want to do this the wrong way, you know. But ironically, the master came back and was angry. He didn't say, well, good thing you were thinking of not misusing this or, you know, losing it or something like that. He was angry for not using it. So let's put that on the table for a second and say this. If you have ability, if you have the ability to generate ability, and you don't, you don't use it rightly, or you don't use it, what's the result? Punishment. Punishment. What did, you remember what the master said in the parable to the servant? You wicked and good. Lazy. You wicked and lazy servant. I find that fascinating. You had something. You know, it's fascinating that the word is talent, right? Because it means a, amount, a measurement of wealth. We use the word talent to mean an ability. And I think that's pretty neat. Because you had the talent, and you hit it. You didn't use it. Wicked and lazy. Tom and Steve. Uh, you, we touched on using, and you were, you were mentioning uh, uh, you had some sympathy on it. Well, if we view it from the idea that uh, you got one. You didn't have 10, yeah. you got one, and what happens when I lose the one, then I, I'm i in, in trouble. You could kind of have some sympathy without that. But the other side of the coin is that what did the master have towards that person? He had confidence in that particular person to give him this one talent uh, to go out and use it. And we've been entrusted with something from the Lord. And for us to not go out and use it because... Well, I, I really don't know what to say to somebody, or I can't, I, I'm mistaken, or I'm not as knowledgeable as, as somebody else, so I better not say anything. How many times have you been cornered, not cornered, but, well, yeah, verbally cornered, cornered uh, with somebody that said something and the door went open and you didn't respond? I, I have done that hundreds of times. And I go away and I say, now, why didn't I say this? Why didn't I say that? And uh, so you can see where you could have some sympathy, but that doesn't excuse his responsibility. Nice, nice. Um, Stephen, go ahead. You're still talking about the uh, right hand handle God's blessings? Mm, sure. Okay, I was just reminded of uh, 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. I think that sort of captures also. Yeah. Stewardship. What if we took the word workman and put the word steward in there? It really wouldn't be inappropriate. It would be a good sense of the idea uh, to put to be a steward who is not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That that really is a great statement, Stephen. Um, I need every one of you to think for a second. Let's go back to this list uh, one more time. New King James calls that list the following. 
um, uh, prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy. I want every one of you to pick one of those and say to yourself, this is the one, maybe I don't have it, but I'm as close to having it as I can. And by the way, all of you, I know you can make something, you know. Uh, I know you can develop mercy. I know you can learn how to be merciful. I know how you can learn to, to exhort. Maybe giving, not going to happen. But every one of you pick one of those. In your mind, just for a second, think about it. The question that I have for you is, what is the reason we give not to use it? Okay, the, the one you picked, what might your reason be? I'll tell you what, I'll give you a couple. Uh, let, let me say leadership. You know, here I am, the head of a home, or uh, you know, uh, you know, the head of this class right now, and I don't want to exercise leadership. You know why I don't want to exercise leadership? Sometimes I'm really afraid of making the wrong choice. I'm really afraid, genuinely afraid of making the wrong choice. So ironically, I make no choice. So there's one. Grant, a lot of times we convince ourselves that we don't have the ability. Very good. Number one, by the way, if you didn't pick an ability, that's that's the issue. Because you didn't think you did. Now, by the way, the Word of God explicitly says, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, explicitly says that God has given everybody a gift, an ability. And by the way, I, you probably could take that to say more than one. So either God is wrong or you are <laughs> Which one? So, good good one, Grant. What else do we got? What other things are there? Uh, why we don't use the gifts that we are given? Why why might we not use them? Too much time? Oh, time. Time. Too much time to do it. And I don't have enough of that. That's a funny thing. That's the, that's the statement universally every human being has ever said. I just don't have enough time. Very good. Teresa? Lack of courage, and God tells us not to be. I am terrified to prophesy sometimes. To tell people, you've got to turn or you're in trouble. <laughs> terrified. I, I utterly struggle with courage, don't you? Forgetfulness. <laughs> uh, I'm assuredness. Assuredness. Matureness. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we don't see ourselves as the one. I think what's funny about that is I think of Moses, who says, God, I'm not the guy to do this. And yet God, you know, like I said, again, what's neat about Moses, I don't have time to say this, but I'm going to say it again. What's so neat about Moses is that, like I said, when Moses stands before God, he says, God, I stutter. Uh, we don't know what, he, he, he says, I just can't speak well. It's, you know, we don't know exactly what it means. I can't speak well. He's 80 years old. He wrote a psalm that said, when you're 80 years old, what? That's it. He said that inspired by God to say that. He's tried this before. When he tried to lead Israel before, uh, Stephen told us that in Acts chapter 7 that Moses tried before. What happened? So he sat down. By who? By, the, by Pharaoh. And his by son. the Egyptians and his own people betrayed him. Moses has fantastic reasons not to do this. Now God sees it as number one, you needed 40 years of shepherding experience. Number two, I don't need someone who's got all the good words because I need to give them to you. And number three, I'll take care of when you're too old. What does it say, by the way, when Moses died at the end of Deuteronomy? That when he died, what about him? His ear was not, his ear yeah. was not. And his vigor was not diminished. <clears throat> That's so neat to me because it's telling us he never wavered. He was never weak, even though... I'm sorry, to kind of get off the track. But give me another one. What else do we got? Reasons why we don't use those gifts. I don't show mercy because why? I chose this. Too humble. Boy, that's something to think about. Uh, and I think that's a problem we struggle with. Too humble. I, I, you know, by the way, this is the trick where you cross over the line from humility to self-deprecation. There's a big word. What's self-deprecation? Just running yourself down. That's not humility, by the way, but it sure is easy to get them confused. And self-deprecation doesn't help you to get things done. I'm going to tell you that from experience. It doesn't help. 
Humility and self-deprecation aren't the same thing, so that's a good one. Anybody else? Why not show mercy? How about uh, how about mercy makes you? Oh, go ahead, Linda. Lack of true love. Oh, that's it. That's a great one. And by the way, Linda, that one could hit why I don't teach, why I don't lead, why I don't show mercy, why I don't give. Now, now before we hit that too hard, true love is that natural? No, very good, Linda. Second Peter chapter one, Peter says you have to work hard to get to true love, and your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, and all stuff. You have to add things up to get to a point where you have true love. So no, we don't all have that. We have to work on them. All of these things are are excellent reasons why it is that we go about. Let me get to one more point. Now, this is probably the most important part of class. This is the thing that you have to think about. You have to walk away tonight and say, what am I going to do with this? How do you discover your ability? The God gave. <laughs> he gave every one of us something. How do you find it? This is the biggest question of the night. How do I find out what I'm supposed to do? How do you do it? Trial and error. Trial and error is nice. You know, I remember funny, uh, funny enough, Tom, years ago I thought, I'm going to try to be a teacher. Uh, I was maybe 19. They threw me in a class of junior high kids. And let me tell you what, those kids ate me alive. And I ran. And I said, oh, that's clearly not something I'll ever do again. It scared me to death. Trial and error. I was going to say try. Try. Yes, effort. Try. Going outside of our comfort zone when we're... We don't know if we can do it, so when we do trial and error, but it's something that we've never really experienced. Why is it so hard to leave a comfort zone? Why is what is it where let me use the word fear again, because fear is the opposite of success in this in this understanding. What am I so afraid of? Insecurity. Insecurity. Tom? Well, we've been kicked in the teeth before. And like Rose to happen again. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to do that again, like yeah. in the teaching. Oh, yeah. Do that. Yeah. Like Moses. Like I said, I think of Moses, and I don't want to go back. What is? What? What is it we're afraid of? Well, the reason it's a teaching, but the reason it's such a big place is that uh, nothing helps you more to learn a subject than teaching. Categorically. Yeah. So, so if we try to extend ourselves into areas we don't think something by doing it we may discover we're really bad that's what we're talking about that's very good very good remote mr rejection rejection failure you know what's funny about that though uh we shouldn't be afraid of failure uh because you know there's a funny statement about uh, the idea of, 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 of manipulating using spiritual value you know remember elijah Greatest battle in, in the old spiritual battle in the Old Testament on Mount Carmel, and he beats a thousand, roughly, thousand Baal uh, prophets and prophetess priests, priestesses. <clears throat> he goes, Oh, I failed. What did God tell him? He said, You know, there's still, remember, he said 7,000 people. What does that mean? What was he trying to tell him? Not alone. Not, Not alone. You know what's funny? There were, there were a lot more people at that mountain. I don't think necessarily those 7,000 people were there. I think what he's saying is those 7,000 people needed to hear what you did. Maybe they weren't there, but that worked. You know, the funny thing about the working of God, we don't always know. We're doing it by faith, right? We're exercising gifts by faith that God gave me the ability. Looks like it failed. Looks like I went to Egypt and they threw me out and that was a big failure. No, I needed a... Uh, a graduate class in shepherding. What Moses needed. We don't always appreciate what really failure is. So when the guy buries his talent, that's failure. Had he used that talent, now I'm going to speculate here, had he used that talent and lost it, I think the master's response at least wouldn't have been, you're lazy, you tried. At least that one would be off the table. The master didn't say success is only measured in doubling things. The master seemed to be saying success is measured in you try. You try. I run us up on time. I, this is so important, though. Number two, the last one we can say there. Actually, let's just go to number three. Ask people. Ask your brethren. What do you think I'm good at? You know, if I wanted to try to do something more than I normally do, what do you think I could do? A lot of times, that's not a question we easily ask ourselves, but other people 
can find it for us. Other people can do it for us. You can create new abilities. In fact, on that list, I'd suggest you probably everything on that list in Romans chapter 12 is something you could create within yourself. You can create new abilities. You can find your ability. You can have others help you with your ability. All have something to do. It's interesting. It's one of my favorite parts of the of, uh, scripture because he starts out with the idea of presenting a living sacrifice. Well, who's the living sacrifice? Me. Yeah. I'm the living sacrifice. And then you go down uh, through all that. Don't think so highly of yourself. And then here's these things you need to do. Why? Because you're the living sacrifice. And so you need to fit into this, this category. If you're going to be successful, you want the reward, <laughs> well, then do something about it. Great, great point. Great point. We're out of time. So we got to stop here. I wish we could spend a little more time on this, but this is important. And this isn't something that ends here. This is a conversation you begin to have with yourself to say, okay, Romans 12 or elsewhere. What is it that God <laughs> has enabled me to be able to do? Or what could I learn how to do? That's it. You've got to examine yourself. Work out. Thanks so much. Great comments and thoughts. I, I do, I do. It's uh, and uh, my fear is that the the uh, screensaver keeps kicking on and on and on. So yeah, it's well, it just the first one. So what what may need to happen is maybe break or somebody else has to place the mouse or something. That's spreading being across the screen. So, okay. Will work in your songbooks to number 320. 320 will be the indicator. 
ago, we had the opportunity to study um, what I would say is my favorite book of the Old Testament, Nehemiah. Um, I really like Nehemiah because I think the man Nehemiah was one of the most faithful and skilled leaders of Judah that we read about in the Old Testament. And there are a lot of things that we can learn from him, uh, many of which we already studied and discussed here in our Wednesday night classes over the last few months. Um, however, there is one small thing in the book of Nehemiah that I really love, which we didn't quite get the chance to look at in our larger study, um, and I was kind of glad of it, because I thought that I could steal it for myself. Um, and that is the way that Nehemiah presents himself to God for all the things that he did in that book. Um, so if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, um, we're going to start off tonight by reading a few short passages um, from a couple of places in Nehemiah. Um, we'll be starting in Nehemiah chapter 5, and you might remember that in Nehemiah chapter 5, um, while he and the people are still rebuilding the wall, uh, Nehemiah has to take some time to address corruption and abuse among the Jewish nobles and officials. Um, at the very end of Nehemiah chapter 5, um, he has this to say, starting in verse 18. <coughs> Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet, for all this, I did not demand the food allowed for the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Then jumping ahead to the very end of the book, in chapter 13, where Nehemiah is in the middle of giving some of his last admonitions and instructions to the people of Judah after he's come back to be governor for a second time. Um, read there in Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 14. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done to the house of my God before his service. Then jumping down to verse 22. Then I commanded the Levites they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Then right at the very end of the book, um, verses 30 and 31, he says, Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Um, so all four of these very similar statements by Nehemiah um, feel kind of... Um, unusually personal to me compared to everything that's in the rest of the book. Um, these are effectively some very short prayers Nehemiah is giving to God 
uh, mixed in with the records of the things that he was doing. And I find it really interesting to think about uh, why Nehemiah might have said these things and why these prayers are left in here for us to be reading today. Uh, by all the accounts that we read in the book of Nehemiah, uh, he was an exceptionally righteous man. Uh, he was utterly faithful to the law of Moses. He didn't do anything, I think, without thinking about whether or not that would be right before God. And despite all that, he still finds it necessary to ask God multiple times to remember the good deeds he's doing in the service of the people. Um, so to answer the question of why Nehemiah is doing these things, um, let's go back and take a look at some of the specific works Nehemiah is asking God to remember. Um, back in chapter 5, I just mentioned that Nehemiah had just been admonishing the Jews for breaking the law of Moses by cheating their brethren. Um, in chapter 13 and verse 14, Nehemiah just appointed the Levites to fulfill their duties in the temple. In verse 22 of chapter 13, he's ensuring that the people are keeping the Sabbath day holy. And then at the very end of the book, Nehemiah is cleansing the people from worshiping other gods and from neglecting the duties of the priests. And so we can see in all the works Nehemiah is asking God to remember are the works of the covenant of Moses. Um, he's asking God not to remember just that Nehemiah is a good person, but that he was faithful and obedient to the commandments that God had given him, and that he was leading the people to do the same thing. Um, these good deeds are not just things that Nehemiah felt like were good, um, not just things that he thought would be nice to do. They are the works that God had been commanding him to fulfill. Um, I don't think Nehemiah doesn't know whether or not he's following the law when he asks these things, or that he doesn't think that God's not going to remember him if he doesn't ask God to do that. Um, I think that all of these statements Nehemiah makes for God to remember the works he's doing are a plea to God for assurance that Nehemiah's obedience is going to be counted to him as righteousness. He wants to know that his faithfulness and his obedience are going to allow him to receive the mercy and the love of God. So as Christians today, uh, we are also commanded by God to be obedient in our works. Um, in fact, in our uh, class we've been doing, the last six weeks have been all about works that we're doing for one another. Um, in Titus chapter 3, Paul tells us that we are to be devoting ourselves to good works, <laughs> not be unfruitful. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're told that one of the main purposes of our gathering together is to be encouraging one another to good works. Um, in James chapter 2, we see that works, uh, good works are necessary for our salvation because we know that faith without works is dead. Um, we were talking earlier tonight in 2 Timothy 3.16 that through the scripture, we are thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, God has given us all works that he is expecting us to be obedient to and to apply ourselves to in our lives. Uh, if you'd like to turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. I'll read a few, a few verses there. In 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, starting in verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Like Nehemiah did, um, we also can have a confidence that if we are keeping the commandments he has set before us, God will remember us on the day of judgment. Um, in fact, in Christ, we have a greater promise than Nehemiah and a greater assurance. Nehemiah was faithful to God under a covenant whose promises were physical, and those promises had been largely squandered by the people of Israel already. Um, his covenant was an imperfect covenant that depended on, on physical works done by men who you couldn't often trust to do them. Today, we have a perfect assurance in God and a perfect covenant under Christ. So if there's anyone here tonight who has not joined us in fulfilling that covenant, we have an opportunity for you right now to do so, to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and to join the <coughs> Um Similarly, if there's any of our members here 
who are struggling in any way with sin or temptation or with trials, um, we'd also like to offer an opportunity for you to come forward to for confession, for encouragement, for the prayers of the congregation for us. Um, if you'd like to do either of these things, please come forward as we stand and stand. <laughs> When Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be you or not, faithful to him will we find us marching with our lips so true and bright. Oh, can we say we are 